Hi, everyone. Welcome to our second installment of What to Read Next, where the Eugene Public Library takes you on a journey of books. Today's topic is food. Mm, I'm hungry already. The perfect part about doing this at dinner time, when we're done, we've talked about everything I want to eat, and I'm too tired to make all of it. So today we're going to take you through food, literature, our favorite cookbooks, and everything in between. We're going to start with our youth librarian, Alec, as he takes us into children's literature. Awesome. Super excited to talk about food books. What could be better, honestly? My and first Alec takes us into children's literature. My first recommendation actually comes from our early literacy librarian, Rachel, um, who told me about this one. It is called Stir, Crack, Whisk, Bake, um, and it's a little book about little cakes. It is a colorful, fun board book for our youngest foodies. Um, it's by the America's Test Kitchen, who's going to get a lot of love tonight. <laughs> a lot of us really enjoy their books. Um, it has these eye-catching, child-friendly instructions about preparing a simple cupcake. Um, it reminds me a lot of an app, actually, because it, it asks you to do things like poke the egg so that you crack them or um, shake up the book so that you mix that batter. So it, it's less, it's more of a game than a recipe. So um, it's more about having fun and playing, but it's very imaginative, super fun, um, really great. I loved this one. Uh, the next one I want to talk about, I don't actually have um, in person because I used our digital resources and got this one off of Overdrive, Library to Go, but it's called Fry Bread, and it's a Native American family story. Recommend it for ages three to eight. Um, it's by Kevin Noble Maillard with illustrations by Juana Martinez-Neal. Um, and to give you a little bit of a flavor, I'll read some of the, just the, the back of it that says, fry bread is food, it is warm and delicious, piled high on a plate. Fry bread is time, it brings families together for meals and new memories. Fry bread is nation, it is shared by many from coast to coast and beyond. Fry bread is us. It is a celebration of old and new, traditional and modern, similarity and difference. This wonderful picture book is all about community. Um, it starts with kids of all races who are carrying flour, salt, baking powder, and other supplies into the kitchen to make the dough for fry bread. The characters gather on indigenous land across the continent to join in the feast. But it's really more about just than just food, because it does dive into some of the social ways, food ways, and politics of all of America's tribes. Um, and in the back, you'll actually find a recipe for fry bread, along with some wonderful source notes that are really great for further conversation. Moving ahead to some books for older readers, some chapter books, we have Jasmine Toguchi Mochi Queen by Debbie Machiko Florence, with pictures by Elizabeth Vukovic. Um, this one, I would say ages five to nine. It's about eight-year-old Jasmine Taguchi. She's a flamingo fan, a tree climber, and a top-notch mess maker. She's also tired of her big sister, Sophie, always getting to do things first. For once, Jasmine wishes she could do something before Sophie. Something special, something different. The new year approaches, and as the Taguchi family gathers in Los Angeles to celebrate, Jasmine is jealous that her sister gets to help roll mochi balls by hand with the women. Her mom says that Jasmine is still too young to join in, so she hatches this plan to help the men pound the mochi rice instead. Surely her sister has never done that before. Um, but actually, pounding mochi is traditionally reserved for boys, and the mochi hammer is a little bit heavier than it looks. So Jasmine has to build her case um, and her mochi-making mochi -making muscles, sorry to say that three times fast, in time for New Year's Day. This book is wonderful for those who love the real-life stories, um, and it offers a window into a Japanese-American family and its New Year's customs. And of course, just like with fry bread, um, the thing that excites me the most about this, well, I wouldn't say the most, but it's definitely exciting, is that there are recipes in the back. There is microwave mochi, in the back with instructions and all of that good stuff. So yes, there's a running theme. All of these books have recipes in the back. I have one more to share for the slightly older readers, ages nine to 12. And that one is called Love Sugar Magic. Well, actually that's the series title. This one's called A Dash of Trouble. 
It's a debut by Anna Mariano. Um, in this one, Leo, short for Lenora, is the youngest of five sisters in a Mexican-American family. Her family owns the most beloved bakery in Rose Hill, Texas. They spend their days conjuring delicious cookies and cakes for any occasion. And no occasion is more important than the annual Dia de los Muertos festival. Leo hopes that this might be the year that she gets to prepare for the big celebration. But kind of like with Jasmine, she's told she's too young. This is another running theme. Sneaking out of school and down to the bakery, she discovers that her mother, aunt, and four older sisters have been, in fact, been keeping a big secret. They're brujas, witches of Mexican ancestry, who pour a little bit of sweet magic into everything that they bake. Leo knows that she has magical ability too, and is more determined than ever to join the family business, even if she can't let her mama and hermanas know about it yet. And when her best friend Caroline has a problem that needs solving, Leo has the perfect opportunity to try out her craft. It's just one little spell after all. What could possibly go wrong? My favorite thing about this book is what Common Sense Media writes, which is mix one Mexican-American girl with some sugar-coated magic spells baked up in her family's panaderia, and you've got a recipe for sweet middle-grade fantasy. I think that encapsulates it perfectly. And, of course, there's not one, not two, but three recipes, maybe four, in the back of this one that you can check out, too. Um, all right, so that is all I have for the youngest readers, and I'm going to pass it over to Angela, who's going to recommend some books for teens. That would be me. All right. Um, one of the things that I absolutely love about food and cooking and everything is that it brings people together, um, which brings me to my first book, The Summer of Jordi Perez um, and The Best Burger in Los Angeles. Um, Jordi, The Summer of Jordi Perez is a fabulous book that features food, but actually features romance. Um, it stars Abby who is a uh, queer, rotund, uh, aspiring fashion blogger who gets the internship of her dreams. Um, and if she does well during the summer, she will in fact get the job of her dreams, um, which will help her be uh, a famous fashion blogger and not just a small fashion blogger. Um, but while there, she meets the infamous Jordi Perez, who is also vying for the same internship. And what she realizes is while they're competitors, she's also maybe falling a little in love with her. Um, the story follows these two young women as they try and navigate a world of stereotypes, of um, peer pressure. Abby's mom is a health nut and a famous like Instagramming health nut. Um, so it is very hard for Abby because she is not super fit. She feels a lot of pressure to conform. Um, and so does Jordy. Her parents want one thing for her and she doesn't really um, love fashion in the same way, but she loves photography, um, which has drawn her into the fashion world. Um, and so you say, how does food come into play with these two? Well, Abby has the most brotastic friend in the world and he is creating an app from his dad who was meant to go test it. And his dad gives him money to go try out all the different burger places in Angeles and to try and figure out what really is the best burger in Los Angeles. So it's all of these competing stories. What is going to be the best burger? Will they fall in love? Who gets the internship? Ups and downs and everything in between. And I will say, if, since it takes place in California, if you uh, happen to have visited a special burger place in California, you may know the secret of really what is the best burger joint in all of Los Angeles. So um, it's a queer fat girl rom-com that fed every of my soul. Um, up next is Hungry Hearts. Uh, it is a series, it's 13 short stories, th 13 stories of food and love. Um, and what really gets me is while Jordi Perez has a kind of side stories the thing that stands out about 13 stories is that attention to detail in the food and really how food can fuel your soul for forever. Um, there were stories that made me cry. There were stories that made me laugh. There were stories that made me very, very hungry. Um, it features uh, 
a diverse cast. Uh, and it really gives you things to think about. Each story from one to the next, while they're short, they're just enough. Like they just give you that um, amuse-bouche of just a little something before your main meal, whether you would like a rom-com or a silly story um, or an adventure, everything in Hungry Hearts is tasty and heartwarming. We're gonna jump into delicious in dungeons. Uh, this is a manga for all of you manga lovers that not only combines our love of food and adventure, but our love of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, it follows this merry band of adventurers. Um, they go deep into a dungeon and come across an evil red dragon. Um, and like every great epic quest, they die. Um, they are soundly defeated and the dragon ends up eating Laos, our main character right here, um, ends up eating his sister. So you're saying, what does any of this have to do with food, Angela? Well, you see, he can't just let his sister be eaten in the belly of a dragon, so he's got to go back in. But they have no food, they have no money, and they have absolutely no supplies. So how are they going to make it to the depths of this dungeon to rescue his sister? Well, that's when Laos comes up with a really, really good but kind of disgustingly creepy idea. Um, what if they just ate all the monsters in the dungeon? then they wouldn't need to buy food, would they? Disgusting and terrible, but ultimately funny and heartwarming. There are pages where they decide to finally eat the monsters. You probably can't see it, but there is also a delicious um, carbohydrates guide that tells you how many fats you're getting, um, how many carbs and how much protein in each of these, including things like um, ballistic steaks, um, walking mushrooms, Maybe they eat a monster or two or 30, um, and through it, they try to find the red dragon on a very, very full, but very kind of disgusting stomach. My last book is Golden Kamui. Now, this book um, same combines a lot of different um things together. So there is adventure and there is food, but it's really kind of historical fiction in that it's set in the 20th century. Um, this is the immortal uh, Sugimoto, and he is a veteran of the Russo-Japanese War. And he has found himself in battle after battle and still found a way to get through. And now that the war is over, he wonders what he will do. He, he sets off to find his fortune. And instead what he finds is a mystery. While searching for gold, he stumbles upon a drunken old man who tells him a story of intrigue. Millions of golden yen were stashed away by an Inuit group and then stolen by a master criminal. Where is all of that gold? Why, well, it's hidden, of course, and you'd have to find the map. But where's the map? Tattooed on the backs of prison inmates now escaped all over Japan. Can the immortal Sagamori find the map and all of the men who have them tattooed on his body? He ends up stumbling upon a young Inuit girl who mysteriously is also looking for the gold for her father was murdered because the gold you see is her tribes. So it blends this rough, tough scallion of a man and this young Inuit girl looking for revenge. And together they go on this adventure and once again, Angela, where is the food in this book? And that's where the real heart of the book comes in, is that she takes him on a journey through her culture and her tribe, from skinning rabbits to breaking down bear. Um, they share meals together, which I think is one of the things that's timeless about food books and about cooking books and about humanity as a whole. When we sit down to share food, we learn so much about each other. And that's what makes Golden Kamui a, a really beautiful book. Now, that's manga, which I'm definitely a big fan of. But Heather, I think you're going to talk to us about, oh, I don't know, some American graphic novels. I am. So Angela's been talking all about manga. I'm going to be talking about some comics for all ages. 
the first one that I have up is for probably more of your tweens, younger teens. It's called Brave Chef Brianna. And this is about a young girl and her 15 brothers. Um, her father is a famous chef and he's gonna leave his legacy to them, but he puts a challenge to them that whoever can make the most successful restaurant will kind of like have his, will win the challenge and kind of inherit his legacy as the best chef. Brianna's the youngest and her brothers are already pretty well established with their restaurants. They have money and ideas of where they can go. One of the rules is that they can't have a restaurant in the same city. When you have 15 brothers, Suddenly your options become very, very small, especially Brianna just finished culinary school. She's very inexperienced and she has no idea where she's gonna get the money or like the people to make this happen. So she decides to find the cheapest place to have her restaurant and it just so happens to be Monster City, which it's named that because it's inhabited by, you guessed it, monsters. And so Brianna is one of the only humans in Monster City and let me just say, Monsters don't really like humans. Um, they prefer to be in their own city for a reason. Um, they don't want to eat from a restaurant with a human there. She finds a very kind of, um, not uh, part, she finds a harpy. Um, so it's a part bird, part human monster to kind of be her first employee. And she begrudgingly takes a job, even though she has no idea what she's doing. She's not very good at it. Oftentimes her harpy waitress is reading books instead of actually waiting on patrons. Um, and also uh, Brianna forgot to read the fine print in the monster bylaws, which is that monsters are not allowed to eat human flour, human sugar, or human meat. And that's pretty much all Brianna's cooking. So Brianna might be breaking the laws in Monster City, um, but the monsters really start to love her food um, and she gets crowds of people in her restaurant and she's kind of overwhelmed. Um, and then someone finds out Brianna's secret and it kind of all goes downhill because she is breaking these monster laws. It's really fun. It's fantastic. There's some really great drawings of these monsters. You can see here is uh, one of our monsters is a giant kind of snake person, which I love. Their tail gets wrapped around um, throughout the whole restaurant. Um, just a lot of humor between uh, the monsters, the different types of monsters and Brianna. And Brianna's quest to kind of um, get out from underneath her father's shadow and the shadow of her 15 different brothers. So this one is the brave chef Brianna. And just like Alex books, there's also recipes in the back. Um, there are quite a few recipes um, that you can try and make. I promise you no monsters are harmed in the making of any of these recipes. So you can be sure that you will not have to go to Monster City to hunt those down. Uh, next up, we have something that's a little more realistic, less monsters. Uh, but this one is called Bloom. It's absolutely one of my favorite comics that's come out in the last few years. This one is definitely a teen one, but if you're an adult, you would enjoy it as well. This is a very sweet story about Ari. His family owns a bakery in kind of a sleepy beach town. And his family has plans for Ari to take over the family business. Ari has other plans, like every teenager. Um, Ari wants to graduate high school and move to the big city with his friends who also happen to be his bandmates and like start a rock band. When you're 18, that sounds like a great idea. Um, his parents think that's a terrible idea because they're good parents. And so Ari has his plan that if he can find someone to take over the bakery that's better than him, his parents will be so thrilled to send him to the big city that he won't have to worry. So he hires Hector, this very cute boy, um, who also happens to be a very talented baker. How do you find a cute boy who's also a talented baker in this tiny, sleepy town? We never know. But Ari suddenly realizes that he might be falling for Hector and maybe a small town bakery life is not the worst thing. Um, the one thing I really love about this book is it's all in these beautiful blue and teal tones. Um, there's also Ari's family is just wonderful and supportive. Uh, they're just all about family and baking and everything they make in this book is all about love. Uh, there's a whole scene with Ari's parents who get up really early to uh, make this certain, here it is, uh, making the dough and they're spreading it out across the table. And even the way the panels are done are almost kind of like plates of like how they're plating the bread and putting it together and twisting it. It's just a really, really beautiful book that's not just about family and first loves, but it's also about food and family and bringing you together. 
it's fantastic. It's a great love story. Um, and you'll have to see if Ari sticks around or if he goes off and decides to be make it in his band. Um, last but not least is something that's a little less um, appetizing, I would say. Um, it's called Meal. And I really feel like this book has kind of two words because you can think meal like you eat. Or also in this case, meal is in mealworm because this book is all about eating insects. Um, so we have Yaro who is obsessed with cooking with insects. She has a fridge with mealworms in it that she puts in her dishes. She puts crickets in her stuff. She just thinks like harvesting and like growing your own insects and then cooking them in dishes is fantastic. So fantastic that she moved across the country to where she knows no one to the city because she heard this brand new restaurant is going to be opening up where they're going to be doing an insect cuisine. And she desperately wants to be a chef there. So Yara um, meets a bunch of other chefs along the way and she just wants to spread this love of insects to everyone and convince everyone that eating insects is fantastic. Um, and some chefs do believe that, but they also realize that People have been eating insects for generations. It's nothing new. Um, and Yaro sees it more as kind of like the next big foodie trend. Like we're gonna all eat insects where other chefs are saying, this is something in my culture we've been eating forever. So Yari kind of gets some pushback for some of the other chefs about what is food? Is food a trendy thing or is food more of a cultural thing that we grew up with? Um, all the comics are done in black and white. Uh, we have a lot of diversity in the characters. There's a little bit of romance because um, Yari is kind of maybe falling and crushing on Milani, one of her neighbors. Um, but you also just get, get a lot of insight into the way different people eat and different foods. Um, so I will say, even if you're someone who maybe does not find themselves eating crickets or mealworms anytime soon, um, you will devour meal anyways. So this one is a fantastic one to read. And I would say this one is teen or adult. It's totally um, open to both those groups. Fantastic, fun read. And so those are it for my comics. So I'm going to pass along to Wendy, who I know has some fun, some fantastic chef memoirs. Pass on to us. Great. Hello, everybody. I do, in fact, have some memoirs that we can sink our teeth into. <laughs> um, and one of them, the first one I'm going to talk about, uh, doesn't have recipes. It's just a gritty, exciting, almost a beach read. It's one of those things you can devour in a day or two. Again, no pun intended. Um, but the other two do have tons of recipes, and they're both quite different. So the first cookbook I'm going to, or memoir rather, I'm going to discuss is Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential. This is his, it's kind of where everything started for Bourdain. Um, you may recognize the name from some of his really popular TV shows, like No Reservations, where he's just this gutsy chef who goes to, you know, far flung regions and tries food and is just a fantastic um, individual and somebody who's very inspiring to chefs and to people who um, want to live kind of an interesting uh, traveling foodie lifestyle. Um, he passed away uh, in 2018, unfortunately, but he left behind an enormous legacy and um, a lot of fans who can cook from his cookbooks, who can enjoy his TV shows, and can enjoy this wonderful memoir of being a chef um, in some of the um, really gritty, underbelly, uh, horrible restaurants in New York City, the kind that probably are shut down after a few months due to food violations, the nicest uh, restaurants in New York City and other cities. Um, it's just a real rock and roll memoir. And um, a quote from the book that really, I think, embodies Bourdain's sort of style and way of looking at food and the way it brings people together is, um, it says, for a moment or a second, the pinched expressions of the cynical, world-weary, throat-cutting, miserable people we've all had to become disappears when we're confronted with something as simple as a plate of food. And it's just so lovely. Um, and this book has a lot of loveliness. It has a lot of um, grit, like I said. It's pretty sassy, definitely PG-13 to R at times. He discusses um, just what it's like, his, his, his drug habit he had for quite a while due to being a chef. Um, uh, different sort of picadillos he got into, but it's super fun and it's super interesting. Um, there's advice, there's drama, there's a little romance. Um, 
sometimes it's salty, um, but it's it's fantastic. Very high octane. I highly suggest it, um, recommend it rather. He also wrote a couple of fiction books, which we have at the library. One's called Bone in the Throat and one's called Gone Bambo, which in both cases, of course, they have to do with a chef and one is a, a kind of a mystery. So those are fun as well. But this is a great place to get started. It just is kind of like peeking in. You know, you, maybe you're at a restaurant and you think, what is it like in the kitchen? What's going on back there? I was a waiter for a number of years in college and then post-college for a little bit. Um, and yeah, it's it's a different world in the kitchen than it is out on the floor where you're, you know, having fine dining experiences. Um, it's, it's really something. And um, there's no part of this book that's not fun or interesting or absorbing. Um, there's a a chapter I really like called From Our Kitchen to Your Table. And it's kind of like all the secrets, the things you should know, the things you shouldn't do. Like, for example, he writes, um, let's see, good food and good eating are about risk. Every once in a while, an oyster, for instance, will make you sick to your stomach. Does this mean you should stop eating no oysters? No way. The more exotic the food, the more adventuresome the serious eater, the higher the likelihood of later discomfort, and that's just the way it goes. But he'll say things like, do not ever order, let's see, you walk into a nice two-star place in Tribeca on a sleepy Monday evening, you see they're running a delicious sounding special of yellowfin tuna, braised fennel, confit tomatoes, and a saffron sauce. Why not go for it? Here are the two words that should leap out when you navigate the menu, Monday and special. He goes on to say that no restaurant's gonna have fresh fish on Monday evening. And you think, why not? Don't people, they deliver on Monday. You're in New York City for heaven's sakes. Well, he lets you know in great detail and kind of in a fascinating way why Monday night you're gonna get old fish at best and it's gonna be mixed in with all sorts of other stuff to hide that it's old. And it just has chapter after chapter about this. And it's just great fun. It's where it all started for Bourdain and I highly recommend it. Very absorbing and juicy. Again, didn't mean to make that pun, but it was there. Okay, so the second one I have is Aeon Halliday's Dirty Sugar Cookies. And if you've never read any of Aeon Halliday's books, they are fantastic. They're a scream. She's super sarcastic. She got a degree in theater. And she says, and much to my surprise, you can't just go out into the world and get a job with a degree in theater. Um, she has a book called Job Hopper about all the different jobs she's had over the years. She's got a great book called um, No Touch Monkey about what it's like to, when she was in her 20s and early 30s, to travel around the world um, and adventures therein. And this is about um, culinary observations, questionable taste. And it is just hilarious. You will enjoy this so much. Um, it's very wry, very sarcastic. And each recipe, I mean, she'll, it's again, it's about, it's a memoir. So it's about her life, her experiences. She's Gen X. So she can talk about, you know, like there's a great section um, in which she talks about her mother got, um, she grew up in Indianapolis. And a friend of hers from New York said, um, what kind of food is associated with Indianapolis? And she's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, it's like Philly cheesesteak. Of course, you think of Philadelphia. Um, Cincinnati chili is its own thing. What do you have? And she's like, corn. And he's like, corn? You can get corn anywhere. She's like, well, OK, funnel cakes. I don't know. I mean, she's just she relates just different periods in her life to food and to recipes and to um culinary experiences. And the recipes of which there are tons, including the uh, dirty sugar cookies you see right here, um, are just fantastic because they are part of the story. It's not just a list of ingredients and techniques. She includes wry comments or asides or notes in them that are just a scream. For example, just a little one. Near the front, there's a quote um, from the Indianapolis Star from 1970. And apparently her mother got a recipe posted in this newspaper. And the quote is, is from May 17th, 1970. And it says, um, Betsy Halliday reduces the secret of being a good cook to an uncompromising demand that all ingredients be fresh and high quality. In fact, she would prefer shopping daily for fresh food, but admits the schedule of the 1970 housewife hardly permits this. So that's a little setup, you think, Okay, her mom got a recipe in a, a newspaper. But then she starts out, the author, Aeon, starts out saying, okay, spinach mornay, recipe, 
Cook three 10 ounce packages of frozen, frozen chopped spinach using no additional water. She doesn't go on to the next step. She says, I guess this is what constituted fresh in 1970, but I might suggest interpreting freshness according to the 21st century definition by briefly steaming three, or heck, four never been frozen bunches. So she adds these little sarcastic asides constantly in every recipe, even if you think, oh, I'm not really keen on making this homemade pie crust, she'll be like, well, here's a little something. And it's just a scream. I highly recommend it. Um, and some of the recipes, I've made the dirty sugar cookies and they're delicious. Um, why they're dirty, you'll have to see. It just has to do with dropping things on the ground. Um, she also talks about when she was pregnant with her first child, she followed this really strict, almost vegan uh, dietary plan called the best odds diet, it included like beet juice and no fun food, no sugar. And she said it was horrible. She was sick the whole time. So she thought with her next kid, I'm going to eat what I want. And it's going to be, you know, she said, I'm not going to be drinking scotch, but I'm going to eat, you know, fattening foods and I'm going to drink things with cream. And she was fine until the ninth month when because of uh, contaminated uh, lunch meat, she got listeria and baby was fine. She turned out fine. But she was like, yeah, this is, this is hard business being pregnant and trying to eat. So just, it's a scream. Highly recommend it. And my third memoir slash lots of cooking, uh, uh, cook, uh, recipes, cooking things. I'm like, what am I trying to say? Ruth Reichel's My Kitchen Year, 136 Recipes That Saved My Life. So if you've ever heard of her, you might know her. She was the, um, she was the lead editor of Gourmet Magazine. And this year, 2009, her kitchen year, um, the book was written in 2015. But that was the year Gourmet Magazine suddenly folded. And it's you know, a 62-year-old, almost an institution. People had lifetime subscriptions. She had no idea this was coming, even though print, you know, cooking magazines were starting to fade a bit. Um, and it just crushed her. She was just completely um, broken down by it. She didn't know quite what to do. Um, she's written other books before this one. She wrote, um, you may have seen Garlic and Sapphires, and it was about her undercover world. She spent some years as the New York Times food critic, and she would you know, don different disguises and just go through all sorts of, you know, have spies in the kitchen that, you know, do they know I'm coming? And just fantastic. So Garlic and Sapphires, super fun. She's also written some other memoirs all around food, Tender, Tender at the Bone, My Kitchen Table, um, which is similar to this one, but this one, it's really just, it's kind of like a diary with beautiful entries, beautiful photographs, and also a cookbook. And she divides it into four seasons, fall, winter, you know, spring and summer, um, and just includes just the loveliest thing. So for example, um, still, so she was an, on a book tour when she discovered that Gourmet was no more. Um, and she said that, do to do, and so I did what I always do when I'm confused, lonely, or frightened. I disappeared into the kitchen. And she just spends the whole year, she'll have these beautiful little quips. Like she'll say, um, dreaming of the pungent, crowded, golden mall in Flushing, New York. Woke up longing for chili noodles and fat dumplings. Alas, we'd eaten them all. But then the next page, she'll have spicy Korean rice sticks with shrimp and vegetables includes just gorgeous photographs Ooh, going the wrong way and um almost every page has just a quote about what she's thinking that day cold shadows on the mountain stark branches huge moon in here there's a fine fire and we're about to eat the world's best rice pudding and you think oh can it really be the best and yes it is sounds like the best and she's talking about how we only had basmati rice but i tried it and it was great and then she'll have the recipe and again she will have the photographs, those are raisins. Anyway, it's just wonderful. You just sink into it for the prose and just the, the beauty of her writing. And then you also get treated to these amazing recipes that saved her life. So just fantastic, highly recommend it. Any of her books are really good, but this one to me seemed especially poignant and special. So very, very good. And this is a nice bridge, I think, because we're gonna now move into the cookbook stage of things. The library has a ton of amazing cookbooks in the children's department, youth department, in the adult section. Um, anything you want, you can find. So 
Uh, we're going to turn now to Alec, who's got some cookbook suggestions that we can all enjoy listening to. So, Alec. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, I know, Wendy, you had shared that you worked in restaurants. And when I was in college, I worked in the dining hall. And I did a lot of different things. But my favorite thing about working in the dining hall was that I got to spend some time in the bakery. And all that really meant for me was that I would just fill um, muffin containers <laughs> or like do really simple things or put whipped cream on like uh, jello and stuff like that. But that leads me into why I am so excited to talk about the complete baking book for young chefs. Um, as I said before, delivering as promised, America's Test Kitchen. This is the level up from the board book earlier with actual recipes and quite beautiful ones. 100 plus sweet and savory recipes that you'll love to bake, share, and eat. Um, America's Test Kitchen has been putting out a lot of really great nonfiction cookbooks for kids. This is the second one, and I think there are more coming out. The first one is um, just a cookbook, but this one's baking. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've done a lot of baking in these pandemic times, um, trying different things, most recently donuts. Sadly, not from this cookbook, um, but it breaks it into different chapters, your muffins, your quick breads, breakfast treats, yeast breads, pizzas flatbreads, cookies and bars, cakes and cupcakes, fruit desserts, pies, tarts, um, all the good stuff. The pictures are wonderful. Um, one thing that I particularly like about it is that it, it includes um, children of different races, um, adding some diversity into um, the baking, the bakers, I guess I should say. Um, haven't tried any recipes in it yet, but I am definitely eyeing just about every single cookie recipe because I'm a cookie fan. Um, but this one is really wonderful. And definitely check that one out. The other one, this is more of an FYI um, because I haven't actually used this one either, but American Girl is fantastic. And American Girl has, I think, maybe upwards of 13 cookbooks that we have. By the way, I buy cookbooks for children um, among other things in the nonfiction section, which is just the best job ever. Um, but there's Around the World, Garden to Table, um, Cookies, Bars, Treats, um, Having a Party, like so many different things. American Girl has your back and will help you host a party um, or whatever it is that you need to do. But I picked this one because uh, in general, the cookbooks that we have that feature cuisine that is not just American, kind of take this all approach. We do have some specific ones like French cooking, or I think we have some African cooking. Um, but this one is um, around the world and it does subdivide each of the sections into country of origin kind of thing. Um, also different kinds of recipes, small plates and snacks, soups and sandwiches, rice and noodles, drinks, desserts. Um, it even has this map, so you can kind of be like, hmm, where do I want to visit in my culinary adventure? And then pick someone and it tells you what page. Let's make banh mi, page 54. I love banh mi, personally. Um, and then you just go to the page. Some have pictures, some don't. Look at that. That looks tasty. I love banh mi. There's a great banh mi place in town. Um, but yeah, this is the American Girl Around the Girl World cookbook. Look for this one and many others. Um, we also have all sorts of cookbooks in the children's section for any dietary needs. Um, we even have, I believe, a keto cookbook for kids that just came out this year. So if you eat keto, um, I was delighted to add that to, to diversify our cooking shelves. Um, but that's all I have for the youngest chefs. Um, good luck to those who are cooking with them, because I know that can sometimes be a challenge. And I'm going to pass it off to our, actually, our star baker, Angela. Angela, I'm sorry, you're muted. I know, I could see Wendy waving at me and I was like, ooh, um, I love technology and you love technology. Um, the fun part was I was actually just singing my own praises. <laughs> so you did not miss too much. Um, but it was in reference to Alex's comment, here at the library, we hosted a great British book-off baking competition 
um, for all the staff back in the day when you could get together and hold fun potlucks together and um, not be afraid of anything. Uh, we shared the love of food with each other. It was super awesome and amazing. And we had a ton of entries and I beat them all very, very soundly um, with a recipe that was a roasted shallot tomato galette with honey and thyme. Um, super, super delicious. It blew away the competition. I think I won 99% of the vote um, and was gifted this magical cake display, uh, which features these beautiful cupcakes. And because viewers, I trust you with a winning recipe, I've included it in the comments section for you. My secrets are double the number of shallots, double the number of goat cheese, use beautiful, if you can, seasonal heirloom tomatoes. Um, I absolutely love baking and cooking and sharing it with others. It's kind of my jam. Uh, when I get off work, the biggest thing I like to do is go in the kitchen and make dinner or bake something. So I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite cookbooks and places to get recipes. The first, if you haven't heard, is Deb Perlman, who does Smitten Kitchen. Smitten Kitchen has two different books. She has the uh, Smitten Kitchen Every Day and the Smitten Kitchen Cookbook. Um, Deb works out of her very tiny New York apartment with her family, um, and she's always creating new recipes. She started as a small food blogger and has now made it into an empire. Um, the wonderful part is if you can't access the cookbook because they are popular here at the library, um, although we do own digital copies. Um, you can also visit her blog. The um, standout best recipe in the entire world is her pumpkin loaf. Um, it is perfectly seasonal. It goes great right now. My only tip for her pumpkin recipe is to pinch off fresh cloves. Um, try not to get the powdered ones. If you get fresh clove, it really, really makes it pop. And I love cloves, so just double your clove intake. Um, so that's Smitten Kitchen by Deb Perlman. Find her online or in the library. Um, it is soup season. So I'm going to show you my absolute favorite soup book. Um, this is from Cook's Illustrated All-Time Best Soups. I've been working my way through this entire cookbook over the last year. Um, as I may have mentioned, I moved from California where it is always sunny and there is no soup weather whatsoever. And I love, 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 love Eugene because of all the fabulous soup days, um, kind of like today. Um, the book goes through really simple recipes. And one of the best things it teaches you is how to make your own chicken stock, beef stock, or vegetable stock. The amount of difference, it takes a little bit of time, but the amount of difference that you get from a box of broth and from making your own is astronomical. You could screw up the soup 10,000 times from Sunday. If you've made your own stock, it still tastes rich and delicious and beautiful. Um, I make a lot of chicken stock, so I tend to get whole rotisserie chickens and break them down um, whenever they go on sale. It gets me through um, all sorts of winter. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it's a farmhouse corn chicken soup. Very delicious. So that's the Cook's all-time best soups. Um, the holidays are coming up. I don't know if you uh, know what is the best baking holiday season for me. Um, so I thought we should talk about pies and tarts, pies and tarts. Um, this book is from the Culinary Institute of America. It's pies and tarts. In fact, the it, full title we learned is called The Definitive Guide to Classic and to Contemporary Favorites from the World Premier Culinary College. <sighs> or delicious pies and tarts. Um, one of the things that I love about this book is that it shows you how to make your own crust. And I think just like making your own broth, making your own crust can maybe take you a few more minutes, but the difference in making your own um, pie tin, it, it's just phenomenal. Um, really brings out this rich, buttery crust. It makes you think you can conquer the world. Like I said, the filling could be the worst. You could have burned it. It could be disgusting, but if you've made your own crust, it's quite good. Um, and one of my favorites is it's not just sweet, um, but this is a uh, very, 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 very tasty because you make your own crust. Um, boop -a -doop, chicken pot pie. Oop, there we go. Um, chicken pot pie is simple and heartwarming and delicious. And when you put uh, your own flaky crust on top, it just takes it to the next level. 
So both sweet and savory, uh, just to get you ready, there's a galette, not the award-winning galette, but there's a galette. Um, pies and tarts is a great start if you wanna make your, your own pies uh, this holiday season. And actually jumps me into one of my favorite new cookbook authors um, that I have found. She's not new, I just found her, so therefore she must be new. Um, which is Erin Jeannie McDowell. And this is her first book, The Fearless Baker. And she takes you on a journey of all different types of cakes and pies and tarts. Um, she's really, really wonderful um, going step through step through the process. She has a whole variety of recipes. As you can see, the photos are gorgeous. Um, she has a YouTube series that she does as well. Um, and today, um, I'm not supposed to talk about it because we don't own it, but we don't own it yet. Um, today, her big book on pie just dropped. Um, and she does such an amazing job telling you step by step kind of the whys behind how your pie works, how you can go from basic to great with only a few different steps. Um, Aaron Jeannie McDowell is going to make my Thanksgiving and Christmas pie game like to the highest notch. Like I already was a winner, but this is going to make me like a, a three-time champion. So those are some of my favorite cookbooks for the for the season. And I'm going to give it to my friend Heather, who isn't as good of a baker, but we'll see. I am a terrible baker. Um, I'm, I love to cook, uh, but baking terrifies me. Um, and so I actually have found uh, this next cookbook um, for children to actually be really helpful for me because it is um, basically how to bake like a pro. And despite me being almost uh, well into my 30s and should know how to bake better, I have found that this book aimed at more probably your eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old age is probably where I am in my baking. Um, this is a fantastic series. They're called um, Maker Comics. So they are a series of comics and they do everything from fixing a car to creating costumes. This one just happens to be a baking one. Um, the thing I love about it is they um, are comic form, which is fantastic. It's really great for people like me with short attention spans, but it, it gets into the science of baking, which is I think why I struggle so hard with baking. Um, I will not tell you the story about how I tried to make pancakes from scratch with no recipe because I figured you just put ingredients in a bowl. How hard could it be? I can make soup and I just toss things in there. I'm sure pancakes will be the same. They were not edible pancakes. Um, so the great thing about this is it follows a young um, girl named Sage who is taking a magical internship with a um, wizard. And she is tasked with baking, which she's like, this is so stupid and boring. Why would I want to be a baker? I'm coming here to do magic. Um, but she learns that baking is its own magic and it's kind of like alchemy. And so even though it's taking a fantasy look at baking, it really gets into the science of baking, which I think is fantastic. Um, I learned so much from this book. For instance, there's a great section in here all about if you are trying to make different types of cookies, if you want a thin cookie or you want a chewy cookie or you want like a really um, like a uh, kind of more of a craggy cookie, whatever has their cookie types that depending on what kind of flour you use, you're going to get those different types of cookies. And it breaks down the difference between a bread flour and a cake flour. It even talks about what is going on in the molecules of the actual cookie um, when they are baking and why they expand and all that different stuff. So this really, really gets into the science of cooking. Um, it breaks it down. It's got recipes in it, of course. It's got a banana bread recipe. It's got um, some cookie recipes, pizza dough. But like I said, the one thing I really like about it is it really explains to you why the things that you're putting into your baking do the things that they do. So that way, if I had read this book before I made my pancakes, I could have made them from scratch because I would have understood the reason you're putting in these eggs is they're going to do this with the baking mix. You're gonna be putting this in there because it does this to expand and get the nice fluffy pancake instead of the like runny hard rocks that I got that were gross. Um, this is fantastic. So especially for kids who are really into the science of things and you want more than just like a recipe if you measure off this, this really explains why it is that you're using melted butter as opposed to maybe a hard butter, why you might use cake flour as opposed to a wheat flour. This gets into all of that and it has some really great recipes in it too. It's great for kids um, because like I said, it's all cartoony and fun. I mean, who doesn't love a little animated cake? 
that's getting frosting put on it. It's fantastic. And you know, even for adults like me, you might learn something and not mess up your pancakes. Um, the next book I have uh, is called Cook Korean. Uh, this one is also a comic book, but you will find it in our um, cookbook section because it is a cookbook. This one is fantastic. Um, so it's by Robin Ha and basically she grew up in South Korea. She moved to United States when she was 14. Her mom loved to cook and she loved to eat, um, but she was not a very good cook. Um, and then she spent some time overseas in Italy and uh, her host family really wanted her to like learn to cook and she was kind of intimidated but learned that Italian cooking is very easy and accessible. Um, and she kind of took that love of cooking um, home with her when she moved back and lived in New York City and she became an illustrator and designer and went to college for it. But she found herself going back to wanting to make this food and especially to the food that her mom made for her. And so she would start emailing her mom for easy Korean recipes. And she learned that Korean cooking is actually really, really simple. Um, and Korean food is some of my favorite. Um, so if you're like me, I love some good kimchi. And there are just recipes galore in here. Um, and she does all the illustrations. She has some stories in here as well. I think I really love about this book is that she's got a little, she's got some cartoon introductions about her life, that kind of thing. She talks a lot about Korean culture, but she also breaks down to like, what's in, if you're, you know, someone who's doing a lot of Korean cooking, what is in your fridge? You know, what is uh, your Korean pantry looking like? What are your main staples? And if you're doing a lot of cooking, um, what's going to be in there, which I think is fantastic. Um, and she really just gets into um, some different cultural things um, and how to do different stuff. Um, for instance, she has a whole section on drinking um, in Korean. Um, but they're really accessible, easy recipes. They are all delicious and fantastic and all have her beautiful art in them. You get everything um, from seaweed salad to spicy octopus, um, uh, just a whole bunch of different fantastic foods. And I would highly recommend this if you are a fan at all of Korean food. If you're not, you can give it a try. You will definitely need to check out your local Asian market to get some of these ingredients, but it's really accessible to read. I would say this one, even though it's an adult book, uh, we have a copy of this in our teen section because it's super easy to use. Great recipes in there. Which brings me to my other one. Let's make ramen. If you're like me, ramen was a staple of your college years. I ate so much ramen. Um, top ramen, uh, the uh, shrimp flavor is my favorite, my go-to. Um, but I quickly learned that making your own ramen is not only super easy, but it is so much better than the ramen you get in the package with your little tiny flavor pack <laughs> that you'll never go back. Um, and this book is fantastic. Much like Cook Korean is again, this fantastically beautifully drawn cookbook, um, that goes through everything that you need to know about making ramen. This book again, gives you some um, look into the actual history of ramen. It was actually a dish that was made in China and then moved to Japan. It became a staple of working class Japanese people. It was like what everyone got. It was cheap and easy to make. It filled people up, um, which is why it translated so well to American culture and to college kids everywhere. And um, it's now become this huge kind of foodie thing in Japan. If you visit Japan at all, like it is a huge competition to be the best ramen place in Japan. And people take their ramen very, very seriously. And even here, it's starting to get that way. Um, we have some great ramen in town, but you can also make fantastic ramen at home. And making your own noodles and making your own broth is all what's in this book. There's just some fantastic different recipes. They go through all the different types of broth. They talk to you about how to make your ramen noodles, different kinds of noodles you can do, um, and just basically different ways to create your own ramen. Honestly, you'll go through this book and you will become a ramen connoisseur and you will never, ever, ever go back to the 99 cents or three for a dollar top ramen again because you will make your own ramen at home that is so much better. Um, and it really, like I said, goes into the equipment that you need, all the different stuff. It's got great recipes and even gives you a touch of culture and history behind ramen. Again, this is another one that would so give to a teenager, a give to a college kid to any adult who's a big ramen fan it's fantastic it's beautiful and i really just want ramen now so hopefully you'll take this one home and make some delicious ramen and i'm gonna pass it off now to wendy who i know has some more fantastic cookbooks to tell us about i'm getting 
so hungry. These all are so good. I'm like, oh, you know, and I, I'm going to check out most of these books. I'll wait till our viewers have done it, but I'm going to get on the holds list. This is just amazing. And you know, it's one really fun, there are lots of fun aspects of the library. The cookbook sections in youth services and adult services are just amazing. I mean, I have to give a little shout out to the librarian who selects cookbooks in the adult second floor reference area. Um, Scott Heron, he's just He's a great cook and he's very interested in cook, cooking. We swap cooking magazines. I get some magazines he doesn't get. He gets some I don't, so we're constantly swapping. Um, but he picks the best cookbooks and he, you know, he really curated that collection well. I mean, if you want vegan, spicy Caribbean cooking, we've got it. You want um, sweet treats for people who have diabetes, we have several. You want gluten free, you want keto, you want barbecue. And it's, I love the how-to, like I love cooking science. I love geeking out, so much fun. And we've got a ton of different, you know, how to sharpen knives. We have a whole cookbook or book on knives. We've got how to um, butcher whole animals. We also have one, um, and I'm not that brave, but we have it if you want to learn. We also have um, something called the uh, vegetable butcher, which is great fun. It's kind of making meaty dishes that are vegan um, meat-like. So I have a couple recommendations and it was so hard just to call it down to two i probably could spend the whole hour yakking about cookbooks as we all can but as alec pointed out america's test kitchen it's just it's a it's a monolith it's amazing i mean they have a million cookbooks i own several their mediterranean cookbook is fantastic um cooks illustrated is their magazine there's america's test kitchen um the the guy who started cooks uh, rather America's Test Kitchen, uh, Christopher Kimball. He is now part of another uh, group called Milk Street, which is very similar in a lot of ways. It has the same kind of feel to it as uh, America's Test Kitchen. But what I'm gonna recommend is um, one of their basic cookbooks. And my mom got it for me a few years ago for Christmas. And we do have it at the library. And it's America's Test Kitchen Family Cookbook. And it's one of those, it's like a binder and it's got all these tabs. It's just fantastic. And I've got, I've used, made so many recipes in this and it's all worn and kind of wrinkled and you can tell where I accidentally spilled some sauce. And um, it's broken down as you'd imagine by salads, appetizers, rice, pasta, slow cookers, uh, bread and pizza, sauces, beverages. It's just got a ton of different um, choices. So, and if you, they'll give different options for different kinds of um, like pasta dishes. So you don't just get one, you get several. And America's Test Kitchen, um, they do what you know it, what they say in their title. They test everything. Their TV show, they have a podcast, um, and in it, they are very meticulous about testing their dishes. And sometimes, certain cookbooks of theirs, I would not recommend to an absolute beginner because they can be a bit intimidating. They're like, whatever you do, don't substitute you know, dried oregano for fresh or everything will be ruined. And um, no, that's not the case. You can sometimes substitute. So I'll be like, oh, I can substitute that. Um, I know that now I have had some cooking failures in the past where I thought substitutions were fine and I was quick and free with them. But um, but I've been cooking long enough now that I, I can take some of what America's Test Kitchen says with a grain of salt. But this is a fantastic cookbook. It's a really good, it has covers all the bases. Um, and it's just infinitely usable. So I'm always going back to it, pushing aside the joy of cooking just to get to my America's Test Kitchen. And they also have binder-like versions of this for um, baking, and they have one for light cooking. So just, you know, kind of every cookbook you could possibly, or a recipe you could possibly want in one spot. And it's great fun. Um, and they also offer product um, reviews. They're a little bit like consumer reports, but with cooking. Um, so they, they offer, uh, they don't get money from, they don't get sponsored. So they're very careful about being able to offer, okay, this is the best tomato paste, or this is the best chef's knife. And they offer different selections. Um, they take themselves somewhat seriously, at least in these kind of sort of uh, seminal, you know, foundational cookbooks, but they're just fantastic. So, and you search for America's Test Kitchen in our nonfiction 
um, catalog designation, and you're just going to be spoiled for choice, which is great fun. So yes, this one is just a good basic cookbook that will allow you to riff as you see fit, and um, you'll never run out of recipes. So the other one I wanted to recommend, oof, also very heavy. So I rode my bike home with some of these in my backpack, and I was just, I felt quite buff afterwards. I'm like, yes, what a workout. Okay, so this is K. Kenzie Lopez Alt's cookbook called wow, The Food Lab. The Food Lab. Also quite the tome. And he also, um, he's really into the science of cooking as well. And of course, this has a ton of gorgeous photos that I'll show you. Um, he, he starts out, he has a great little quote. Let's see. He says at the beginning, my grandfather was a, an organic chemist. My father was a microbiologist. And I was a little nerdling. <laughs> and thus begins his culinary career. Um, he loves applying the scientific method to his cooking. And he's he was described as being very um, accessible. His recipes aren't necessarily complicated, but they are precise. I made a recipe of, um, it was chorizo and potato tacos. And at first, so he said, you know, cube your potatoes. And so I was going to boil them and kind of, you know, I was cubing them and I was just going to boil them. And then I read the recipe as opposed to just riffing. And he said, put your potatoes in cold water, add some vinegar and a ton of salt and then bring it to a boil. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, that's not what I was going to do. So I did it because then you pan saute the potatoes and they're super crispy thanks to his method of doing it. And so, and it just, they were super successful. I ate way more than I should have for research. Yes, all this is for research. I mean, like, for example, he talks about like the different ways to, don't need my sticky note, different ways to grip your knife. And he really tests different ones. He talks about why one might be better than another. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple. He, he asks, as you may wonder, which salt do I use? Which salt is the best salt? You know, I've got table salt, is that fine? Why use kosher? And he explains in a very light way. He doesn't take himself seriously in the sense that you can't riff on this or you're in trouble. He's like, you can use table salt. It's just not gonna be as good as kosher salt. And he explains why. Um, he talks about different kinds, what he does too, and it's really helpful for me and I also can geek out with him. Um, I am also a nerd. Uh, so he talks about like, okay, so how do you make good scrambled eggs? What does a good scrambled egg look like? What does one that's not so good look like? So this, for example, whoop, hold on. She's talking about different kinds of techniques. He includes photos. And over here, he shows, okay, well, this is an example of a good scrambled egg. This is what happens when you don't do it quite right. So he walks the walk and, uh, like, should I add oil to my pasta water? He's got a whole page on that. Like, yeah, that's what you hear, right? But here's why, not necessarily, though it's not all bad. Um, yeah, he just gives you ideas about everything. And I got really excited when I first saw this cookbook, when it came out in 2015. So I love cheese. May I never become lactose intolerant because I could eat just straight from the brick of cheese on a regular basis. It's such a delight for me. And he has this whole fantastic section, the cheese charts, and he's got every kind of, what's the, what's the consistency? What's the place of origin? Is it better to have sheep's cheese of this kind or goat cheese or what's, you know, he just goes into it and geeks out and talks about the different consistencies and properties and it's pages long. And then, then the recipe, ultra gooey stovetop mac and cheese comes next. And I'm just like, ah, and it's fantastic. Everything's great. One last example. This is from fried fish sandwiches with creamy slaw and tartar sauce. And he shows onion rings, which I've never tried to make myself. I'm a little nervous about deep frying because of a mishap with some chicken a couple years ago. Anyway, um, but then he shows like, okay, well, here's a good onion ring. Here's one that's not so good. And why? And the way he explains it, you can just sit down and read it. You're like, I'm not gonna make these recipes. I just wanna read the science behind it. And it's just fantastic. So he goes into everything. And as any good cookbook, at least modern cookbook, he's it's got tons of photographs. So you can just sink into the beautiful photographs, his explanations, 
and it might make you a better cook. At the very least, it'll make you more well-read and you can be snobbish to your friends like, oh, that's not a good onion ring because the batter was a little thin. So highly recommend it. And I'll be returning this soon so you can check it out. And that is pretty much it for our show as it stands. But we have questions. If you have questions, we'd like to answer them. Um, so yeah, have at us. <laughs> And we'll be posting in the comments if you don't see. We have all of the books already for you available either uh, in real life or in digital life. And this is only our second What to Read Next. And we will follow it up with next month's What to Read Next, which we focus on how to get the perfect gift for the hardest to get people. Um, holiday reads. Uh, give the great gift of a book. Be that aunt or that uncle or that parent who said, oh, it's a holiday time. Here's a book for you. Um, everybody loves that person. Um, so join us next month. We will have great holiday reads. You might see some of us. We might uh, change it up and be a little sassy. Um, that's what you get from us. So thank you, everybody out there in the digital land. Um, we appreciate it. Once again, fill out a What to Read Next form. Maybe you can get the elusive Scott to fill out a whole cookbook list for you of his favorites um, or get some fun and exciting comic books from the rest of us. So have a great Thank night, you. everybody. Good night.